During my clinical training, I used to love best the cases that had a clear diagnostic answer. Patient comes in, you order a test, bam. You know what to do, patient gets better. I was shocked to learn that one of the most common decisions that a physician makes, whether or not to treat with antibiotics, is almost always guesswork. This is nowhere more a problem than in surgery. See, the body's response to surgery looks just like the inflammation caused by an early infection. And so very commonly, we would take someone to the operating room, case goes great, and then post-op day two or three, we're doing morning rounds, and the nurse says, hey, you know, Mr. Jones had a fever overnight. Now, there's about a 5% chance that represents an infection. And so we don't really know what to do. We don't have a test that tells us whether or not the patient needs antibiotics. I'm sure that in my practice, I ended up giving antibiotics to people that didn't actually need them. And I remember vividly the cases where we said, now nah, let's see how Mr. Jones does today, and we'll see if he's any sicker tomorrow. And then sure enough, we open the door the next day, and Mr. Jones is frankly septic, has to be packaged up, shipped to the ICU. I'm not alone in this. The statistics around antibiotic usage in the United States are pretty shocking. Around 300 million courses of antibiotics are prescribed each year in the US. So on average, five in six Americans gets treated with a course of antibiotics. And of those, about half are given for conditions which are likely not bacterial in nature, either viral or non-infectious. Now there's two problems to this. One is that antibiotics have side effects. We know that about one in five patients treated with a strong antibiotic will have a directly attributable adverse drug event. But arguably the bigger problem is that of antimicrobial resistance. So when a country begins to use more and more antibiotics, the bacteria begin to evolve defense mechanisms. And it gives rise to the so-called superbug, or bacteria that are resistant to common antibiotics and need more toxic drugs to treat them, or sometimes are resistant to all drugs. So why are physicians naturally defaulting to treat with antibiotics? Well, physicians fear that a normal infection will become what's known as sepsis. Sepsis is not well known to the lay public, but it's a public health crisis. Sepsis kills 20 to 30% of the people it afflicts. It's associated with half of all deaths in hospital. And it's the single most expensive diagnosis in all of Medicare. Sepsis is defined as a dysregulated immune response to an infection. What does that mean? So the immune system normally kicks off inflammation in response to an infection to help fight that infection. But in sepsis, that inflammation gets into a feed-forward cycle. Inflammation begets more inflammation. And suddenly, the immune system damages the body's own organs. We know that treating patients with bacterial infections reduces the sepsis burden. So in patients with severe sepsis, for every hour of delay in antibiotics, the relative risk of mortality goes up by 7 to 8%. We also know that patients with acute infections are much less likely to become septic if they get antibiotics early. So the question then is, why don't we have a test that tells us who needs antibiotics? Well, for the last 150 years or so, Physicians have been diagnosing infections in the same way. Basically, we take some blood, we look to see whether there's bacteria in the blood. And there are two major problems with this. The first is that even with the newest, most advanced tools, that process still takes hours. But the second is that most infections aren't bloodstream infections. So you can have a skin and soft tissue infection or a pneumonia or a belly infection, it hasn't made it into the bloodstream. To give you a sense of the numbers, looking at patients with community-acquired pneumonia, maybe only about 2% of them have a bacterial bloodstream infection. In patients in the emergency room who are retrospectively judged to have bacterial infections, only about 10% have a bloodstream infection. And even in patients with frank sepsis, the sickest of the sick, it's only about 40 to 50%. So when you find bacteria in the bloodstream, for sure that patient needs antibiotics. But when you don't, it doesn't mean that a patient is safe not to treat. Now, there's one diagnostic system that has been around forever 
that's fantastic at diagnosing infections, and that's the immune system. So the immune system has evolved over millions of years to be exquisitely sensitive, to know exactly what it's reacting to. And it doesn't just diagnose infections in the blood, right? The immune system circulates throughout the body, so it can detect an infection anywhere. And it does this early in response to infections through a series of cellular receptors called pattern recognition receptors. So these are receptors on immune cells that look for conserved pathogenic molecules. Things that are only found in bacteria and viruses, like the types of sugars that bacteria incorporate into their cell walls, or the types of RNA that only viruses use. And when the circulating immune system senses one of these molecules, it sends up a danger signal. Hey, we probably have an infection present. Come help me fight it. So the hypothesis is, shouldn't we be able to use that signal to diagnose the presence of an infection? Actually, it wasn't our hypothesis. People have thought this might be true for a long time. About 10 or 15 years ago, there was a new technology invented called transcriptomics. Transcriptomics is a way to study the activation levels of all 30,000 genes in the body at once. And so dozens of research groups around the world over the last decade or so have used transcriptomics to profile the immune system in patients suspected of having infections. And with enormous respect and gratitude to those researchers who've come before, none of the signatures have actually turned out to be true or conserved. The reason is that each researcher tends to do the study in the same way, which is to say, in a narrow population that's actually feasible to study on a university budget. So they go and they say, well, at one hospital, we're going to study just kids, say, um, suspected of having bacterial infections in the emergency department. And the problem is that when you take that signature that they discover in those kids in that emergency department and you try to apply it in adults, maybe at an ICU, at a totally different hospital, um, in a totally different country. The signature falls apart. So about five years ago, I left clinical practice to work on this problem. Joined the bioinformatics department at Stanford in the lab of Pravesh Khatri. Pravesh is a computational immunologist, and he had shown that by inventing some new statistics, he could put together data from multiple cohorts. He had done this initially in organ transplant rejection, showing that by looking at different kinds of organ transplant rejection, things in heart, liver, kidneys, lung, he could find a conserved general signature. And when I showed up in the lab, he and I worked together to turn that into a solid diagnostic discovery computational pipeline. When it came to acute infections and sepsis, what we did is we gathered data from children and adults from inpatients, from outpatients, from countries around the world. And we asked, what is the immune signature that is generally true across all of these patients at once? To some degree, this turns scientific dogma on its head. The traditional experiment, you get rid of heterogeneity to drive up your statistical power. What we did is we incorporated extra statistical heterogeneity, made it tougher on ourselves, with the assumption that what we found to be true across numerous populations would remain true when we went out to validate externally. And that's exactly what we showed. Over a series of manuscripts, we laid out that we could determine the presence, type, and severity of any acute infection. In the simplest form, looking at the expression levels of just seven genes from the blood, we can tell whether a patient with an infection has a bacterial or a viral infection, whether they need antibiotics. And with a larger expression pattern, with 30 genes, we can tell who needs antibiotics, what downstream diagnostics they need, and what level of care, whether they might need to come into the hospital or go straight to the ICU. When we saw that that was possible, we decided to co-found a company, Inflamatics, to turn that into a rapid 30-minute point-of-care test and to continue to work on the machine learning and the bioinformatics that underpin the signature itself. But we've also shown that the general technique is broadly applicable across a number of disease states. So not just acute infections and sepsis, but also tuberculosis, malaria, dengue fever, influenza, and even non-infectious conditions like autoimmunity and organ transplant rejection. Really, 
any immune-mediated disease is amenable to this kind of discovery effort. Our goal now is to make sure that in the future when physicians are trying to choose life-saving treatments, they don't have to guess. And our fervent hope is that next time you end up with a cold and you're at the doctor's office wondering whether or not you need antibiotics, we'll have a test there that can tell you. Thanks very much.